Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Everybody sounds all lively and awake this morning. Let's do, let's do something. Are you guys really awake? Let's give a little shout of praise on the count of three. One, two, three. Woo! All right, cool. Um, as Michelle was saying, she was reading the verse, you know, the Lord is an everlasting God. He will never grow weak or weary, even when we do. Um, it, it's just an amazing thing to think about how powerful our God is. He is God. You know, we can't think of him any certain type of way. We can't fit him in a box. You know, our understanding doesn't even circumference who he is. But yet we're still his children. He still calls us our own. And he still loves us like little children. And I found a verse the other day. It's Psalm 145, verse 8. And it says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. So even though God is almighty and all-powerful and never grows tired, he's still compassionate towards us and slow to anger, and he's patient with us. And that enough is a reason why we should come and just give everything we have in worship. Do you all agree? Amen. That is awesome to me. So let's worship this morning and just give everything we have. joy to say your will your way. Sing with me. It will be my joy to say yeah. your will, your way. It will be my joy to say your will, your way. It will be my joy to say your
Let's sing this together. Bless the Lord. Ready? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing I dare not trust 
us the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood in righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name in Christ alone cornerstone we can be strong in the Savior's love through Sunday to Sunday, Lord, just to come and worship together in, Lord, this free country, God. I just thank you for the freedom that we have here. God, I thank you for, for loving us with all your heart, Lord, and calling us your children. I just thank you for your, your salvation, Lord, and your victory over our lives, Lord. Thank you for loving us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can be seated. I invite the ushers up to come up and take a morning offering.
Okay. Now, we can all hear me now. How many of y'all are having one of those mornings? Just raise your hand. Just be honest. Keep it real. I'm having one of those mornings. So, I got my whole allergy thing going on, and I've been sick, like, it seems like each Sunday for the last two months, it seems like. I got my snot rag up here. So, if you if you just see me kind of just give you a little hing honk or whatever, just forgive me on that. And then, I set my Bible up here this morning, so I'll be ready. And then I went in this utter state of panic a while ago because I said, well, where's my Bible? Usually I sit in my chair. So you told me to take off running to my car out there because I thought I left it in the car, and it's been sitting here the whole time. But uh, if you're joining us for the first time this morning, I'm out of breath still because I ran in my car. If you're joining us for the first time this morning, uh, my name is Matthew Gallery. I am the lead pastor here. Um, just quickly before we get started, we got a lot of folks out this morning, if you noticed. Um, we got two families that are battling the same stuff I'm battling, it seems like, with this head cold stuff. We got uh, the raspberries, who uh, their son fell, and we don't know if he's broke his hand or not yet this morning, so be in prayer for them. And also be in prayer because we got two other families that are coming back from uh, Disney World, right? Florida? Yeah. They had a dancing competition, so uh, they're on their way back from Florida this morning, so just uh, remember them for safe travels and uh, no speeding tickets. So, uh, but if you have uh, got your Bibles here this morning, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 18 through 22, right first to start off with. And for those of you who didn't bring a Bible or may have left it in your car, like the pastor thought he did, and it's up there on the screen. Uh, what we're going to be talking about this morning is just a, this is just going to be a one Sunday thing, because I generally don't like to talk about negative things. I generally like to talk about what we're for. And what we're what we're not against, um, but uh, if any of you have been alive in the past week, you kind of know the state that our country is in, and not necessarily our state, but our church as well, and just as a community as a whole. As far as people not getting along from all different sides, and it's not just in Charlotte, it's not just in America, it's in our homes and our families, in our businesses, in our friendship. For some reason, people have a tendency to make really hard to get along with each other. And the biggest lie I think the devil's throwing in our face today is that just because two people disagree, I think the biggest lie that he's telling us is just because two people disagree means that they don't necessarily have to hate each other. And that the enemy is not the person you disagree with, but the enemy is the devil itself. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 to 22. It hits on my first point. If you look, if you come in the front door, you got a little uh, thing. Mine's yellow because I printed out on the wrong piece of paper beforehand. But it's so got my points here, and it kind of follows through my game, my uh, game plan. Um, the very first point is we are each equal, but different. And that's a very key thing to remember when you're looking at disagreeing with your neighbor or your friend or your family member or the guy down the street, whoever it might be. Because each one of us in this room is a child of God. I don't care what you look like, where you come from, whatever. But contrary to some, you know, things you might see on Facebook stuff, we are different. I mean, just look, I'm good looking, you know. I, you know, some of you ain't. I'm just saying, you know. The preacher just called everybody ugly. That's terrible. But, you know, some of us just come from, some of us are very laid back in our personality. I'm a very laid back person. Michelle is very organized. I'll say that. She's very strict and to a point. I mean, she's got her little, she's got a little calendar on our little refrigerator. I think there's little, she's got 18 different little notebooks sitting around the house in every different place with, with schedules on them. And she don't never look at none of them. So I don't know why she writes them. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 through 22. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Notice the exclamation point there. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. I flipped through them. I ain't remember about it. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. Now, we're not talking about the body of Christ this morning, but we are talking about how we fit together as a whole. Because God made some of us hands, 
God made some of us feet. God made some of us, whatever the foot is strong at, the hand is weak at. And whatever the hand is strong at, the foot is weak at. So my point with this is that it's okay to be different. Because you're not different because you're not good enough and because you're not who God wants you to be. God made you exactly who he wants you to be. If you're a hand, God made you a hand. If you're a foot, God made you a foot. But we all make up one body that is the church. That's what the church should be. And we shouldn't, we don't have the right as Christians to look down on different people because they got different strengths and different weaknesses than us. It is natural and okay to have disagreements. Naturally, if uh if I am a foot and what I do is um what does a foot do? Just saying they they are strong and they just kind of sit around all day. Let's just face it. I mean our feet kind of get overlooked. Right, because I'm standing up here on my feet. I got shoes over them. I don't really pay any attention to them. But my feet are actually stronger than my hands. You know why? Because I don't walk around on my hands all day. That's why we may walk around on our feet. So my hands, they got really long fingers and nimble. I didn't catch a baseball. Can't throw a baseball, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. But, I mean, I can play a piano. You can pick a guitar on with it. I can't pick a guitar, but Jared can. But hands do different things. They're nimble. But yet, if they tried to do the job that the feet do, they would fail miserably. So naturally, one thing that, that, that just because they're different, they got different strengths and weaknesses, it's easy, it's very easy to look at something different than you and think, hmm, maybe they ain't, maybe they ain't cutting the cheese. Maybe they ain't, they ain't pulling their weight around. And so the hand understands finesse. It understands how to pick things up and be delicate with things. But the hand doesn't understand strength, that steadfastness. So in the body of Christ, in the church, and in your friends and your family and your business, you can take this anywhere you want to. People have different strengths. They have different weaknesses. And they come from different backgrounds, which might lead them to believe certain what things, the way they do things. We're going to be different, but it's okay. It doesn't make that person your enemy just because they're weird. <laughs> moving on if we handle these disagreements it's the way we handle these disagreements that sets us apart from the world James uh, 1 verse 19 it's a great passage of scripture it says understand this my dear brothers and sisters you must all be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to get angry In verse 20 it goes on to speak about it says that the angry do not serve the fruit of the righteous. In other words, if we get angry and we act like fools, we're not being the Christians and the people that God wants us to be. It's how you react to these differences that's going to set you apart and make you different from the world. We cannot change at all how the world reacts to us. The only thing that we can matter and that we can affect is how we react to it. not about changing anybody else it's about how we handle it and how we walk it out with honor there's a lot of things to do when disagreeing and we're not doing there's a few things what not to do and what we're going to go down here is going to kind of go through a list um what not to do and it's very easy i think we can probably add on and make a list down probably down to the floor and roll out on the floor about what not to do what not to do when you disagree with somebody and when you, uh, when, you, when you have an offense with them? Speak before thinking. Hmm, that's a good one. Because this day and age, it's very, very easy to speak before thinking. We've got a lot of platforms to voice our opinions and to throw our judgment on people. We've got very few platforms to actually listen. Facebook is a very prime example from that or to Snapchat or whatever else people got because I don't got hardly none of them. But it's very easy to get on time anytime you're offended, anytime you, you have an offense against a person, anytime somebody so much as looks at you a wrong way, it's very easy to jump to conclusions and say the very first thing that pops into mind. My granddaddy, I spent a lot of time with him growing up and he was one of the 
the the most laid back, calm, patient people that I have ever had the chance to be around. And one time when I was in high school, I was ticked off about something. I couldn't even I couldn't even tell you what it was now. And he used to sit over there in his chair and he smoke his pipe and the guy's chewing tobacco. Don't do that, kid. But he always leaned back and he would he was known for being a very quiet man, but when he spoke, people listened because they know he had already thought about it and, and, and drawn up all the clues. He was saying something that he truly felt needed to be said. And he said, Matthew, before you go out and you jump down this person's throat and you tear them a new one for disagreeing, he said, I want you to go home and I want you to just think about it. Just sleep on it. He said, if you're still bothered it by it in the morning, then you can go up to them and say what's about. But when you go home at night, put yourself in their shoes and figure out why they might be mad with you because I guarantee you they're probably doing the same thing tonight. And what not to do? Take offense. Now we're each different like we kind of laid out there a few minutes ago. God made us different. And because we're different, we're going to see the world different. But that doesn't mean that the person is against you just because they view the world a little bit different. Our natural reaction now, if you go on any social media page, if you even look on TV, is to think, and it's the biggest lie that the devil says today, is it just because me and Kevin might disagree on something that he's against me, when in fact he's just got a different opinion. Me and Doug might have a different way of doing something. Matter of fact, me and Doug got a lot of different ways about doing something because Doug was brought up in uh, a different generation. That's a nice way of calling you old, Doug. There you go. Yeah. I was born in 1986. I'm, I'm 30 years old. What year were you born, Doug? Yeah, so I can't even do the math in my head. Hey, it's, just, it's, it's a lot older than I am. So with me, if me and Doug were to go off and say we're going to build a barn together, or I might have my own way of doing things. I might want to do things with a Black & Decker power tool or whatever fancy gizmo I can find. And Doug, he might want to do it with a handsaw just because it's Doug. I don't think Doug's going to do it with a handsaw, but he might have his opinion because he's done things differently. But now is Doug against me just because he wants to build a barn differently? No, he's not. But in this day and age, and if the devil would have his way, it would be for me to look at Doug like he's against me because he's just against my opinion. What not to do, number three? Try to win at all costs. Now this, I could preach on all day long. This is what tears families apart, and this is what tears friendships apart. I can think of a lot of churches right now that has let this tear them apart because there's a different disagreement, but there's no compromise. Sometimes as Christians, we got to know when to cut our losses and agree to disagree. And when I get into it in a minute, I'm going to talk about not letting it separate you. But I've been on, I spent a lot of time on Facebook. I probably shouldn't say that or whatever because there's generally not a lot of stuff good happens on Facebook. But I look and, you know, I'll go on all these little pages and stuff. And it's so cool because I see people commenting in the comment sections. And it always works out like this. They'll have a disagreement and come from different sides of the issue. And then they'll explain why they're disagreed and, and why they're different. And then they just come to a wholehearted, uh, warm, fuzzy feeling. No, nobody's ever changed anybody's mind on Facebook by arguing on Facebook. What always happens is that neither side decides to back down. Neither side chooses to just let something go and never realize that you're just different and you're never going to see things the same way, and that's okay. Now, there is a right and a wrong to stand up for, such as right and wrong, what God says is right and wrong, but a lot of these issues that are tearing us apart today don't matter. They don't matter one bit. And at the end of the day, if me and Doug decide to build a barn differently, if he's not willing to back down, and I'm not willing to back down, and my main objective is winning the argument, 
then all it does is tear us further and further apart. And literally, as foolish as it might sound, there have been families that have not spoken to each other for a long time because of disagreements about where to put a bathroom in a house or what to put a color carpet in a church or whatever issue might be. What to do. The Bible has a lot to say as far as what to do. Number one on what to do is shut up and listen, dummy. I'm, I'm paraphrasing that, of course. A lot of times we want to speak, we want to be heard before anything else, and we want ready to listen and see that maybe, just maybe, the other person has a valid explanation. Two, assume the best. This is the one thing, I want to talk about marriage starting next month and, uh, and, and relationships. And whether or not you're married or not, this is going to be a, a cheap sales pitch for the next sermon series. Um, that's going to be a great one. Whether or not you're married, you've been married, you're single, you don't ever intend on getting married again. It's a great one because it looks at relationships and about how God uh, has made you his bride. So it's got a lot to speak on both of them. But one of the biggest things that helped our marriage was that me and Michelle, when we were uh, just coming together, just got engaged, and we were really starting to kind of form our lives together, like as one couple, as one. Me and Michelle love each other, and we got a lot in common, but if you spend enough time around me and Michelle, you know that we're very different. Um, like I say, I'm very laid back. My family, we very rarely uh, say anything serious. And, and, and her family, a lot of times, oftentimes say stuff and they're jokesters and they're great people and I love them to death but sometimes they take things literally it's just a, a, a communication difference that's different from our backgrounds and the way we grow up so when we were getting married and stuff I would joke things and I would say things to her Michelle say amen okay I would say things to her totally meaning it as a joke and meaning it to be funny but yet she took it literally because of where she came from, because she was different than me. And one of the wisest things Michelle ever said to me, we sat down and we figured out, okay, how can we look and how can we get along better going forward? And one of the best things she ever said to me, she said, Matthew, I think it would be a lot better if we just assumed the best in each other before we ever got into an argument. And the world today would be so much better if they just assumed the best in the other person before they ever took offense. I've been mad at a lot of people in my life, and I've took them together a little, a little, you know, and and, and I get kind of like, well, they said that, and how many of y'all have ever got those people, you know, that do it, and you're kind of like offended by them, and you're ticked off with them, and then everything they do for the next six months, it is like, it gets in your mind, the devil puts in your mind that they are doing it just to spite you, you know what I mean, like, like, they dropped a McFlurry in the parking lot, and it splashed on my tire, you know, or something like, it's just something ridiculous and stuff. Now, yeah, I went inside McDonald's and ordered a $3 milkshake just to throw it on your tire. Now, now the, the kicker be they just dropped their milkshake or whatever. Any little thing like that, we take and we, and we turn it into offense. And we turn it into them out to get us. When in fact, if we just went up to the person and we said, look, buddy, uh, I love you, but... Um, this hurt my feelings, and maybe you didn't mean it this way. Then we would see things in a whole other way. Jesus had a little bit to say about this, believe it or not, guys. And in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 16, it's not on your, on your outline, but uh, I'm going to read it for you. Jesus was talking to the disciples, and uh, they were kind of figuring out how to, how to kind of shake this thing out. Jesus says, If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. Now notice there's two things here. Go privately. Don't blast them out to the community and on Facebook and, and to your family and friends. And then notice he says, and point out the offense. He doesn't say, tell them what they did wrong. Tell them how they're a terrible person. He says, just bring it to their attention. And if the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. 
a lot of times all we need to do to figure out solve a disagreement and to solve an argument is to just go out to somebody and say look Charles uh, I, I love you man but you said this to me like two weeks ago and it's just been taking root not literally Charles don't panic using this illustration but and uh say so if Charles did something to me and I can go up to Charles and say look Charles you said something two weeks ago and uh it's just been really stirring on me and I just want to know did you realize you said that because I'm assuming the best in you because me and Charles have been friends for six months now and so why am I going to let one cross word ruin six months of friendship don't you think that your friends and your family who you've loved and cared for for your entire life deserve the benefit of the doubt if they've shown you nothing but love your whole life why would all of a sudden they turn and try to slight you it doesn't even make sense and a lot, I guarantee you what, a lot of times what happened is Charles would say, Matthew, I, I, I didn't even mean it that way, man. I was just doing it to be a joke or something like that. And Charles hasn't even realized he's offended. And a lot of times we would solve arguments before they even began. Charles, I love you, bud. You're good. All right, there you go. Good deal. Bring a mediator. Three. This is Jesus speaking out in the very next verse of what he just did. He said, but if you are unsuccessful, in other words, if the person kind of did mean to stick it to you, because every now and then people are just people are just jerks, you know. You think if the, you walked up to them and, the, and you slapped them, the preacher would say amen. You know what I'm saying? There are some people like that in this world. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So at no point does it say rally the troops around them and get a mob around them because actually if you bring a mob toward them, you're just going to put the person on the defensive. But it may help at some times to bring someone that you both love and that you both trust to go up to the person and say, look, this is the issue. Help me to understand the other person's side because some of us in this life have come from different backgrounds so that no matter how much we may try we can never see the other person's side like i was raised uh, in on a farm in green county north carolina and so 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 my background is going to be very very different from somebody that was born in a rich mansion in malibu has never seen things from my point of view we live completely different lives and we're going completely different places. And so sometimes it might help if we have a mutual friend that we both trust to come up there and say, look, I love you both. And say, Charles, this is what Charles means, Matthew, when he says this. Because Charles isn't meaning to offend you when he says this. This is just the way Charles said it. And then to be able to look at Charles and say, Matthew, he, he doesn't mean it when he... he uh, you know, blows his nose and it's not right while he's preaching. He doesn't mean that against you, brother. It's just, he's just got a cold, man, you know, whatever it might be. So if we do that, it would help out so much. And then number four, realize that the enemy is not the other person. Now, how many of y'all know this scripture and know it by heart that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against evil powers and authorities in the supernatural world? Now, what that Bible verse is saying is that your, bro your enemy isn't your brother. If we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, we're all family in Christ. Just because I may disagree with you and may have an alter an opinion doesn't mean that I'm fighting against you. And so many times we think that just because Doug may want to build a barn differently, that he's my enemy. No, we're just different. And the enemy is the devil which tries to sow that seed of bitterness and contempt in there. We're going to go to the whiteboard here and we're closing up here. Let's see how much time we got here. Yeah, we got time. All right. Good deal. You always know it's about to get real when the whiteboard comes out. All right. So, say when, y'all. Okay. Good deal. Um, I think I'm, 
think something's pretty terrible here. Mario, did you set this thing up? Uh, see, now, I could disagree with Mario right now and take offense to this. Because he's making me look like a fool. You meant to do this, didn't you, Mario? Did you mean to do this? Thank you, Lord, for this real-life illustration this morning. So why we're supposed to assume the best in people. Now, there you go. Give it up for Mario. Okay, this is a very good illustration here. I didn't even mean to do it. Mario was running around. He is one of our top-notch volunteers at New Direct Church. Everybody say thank you to Mario. Mario was doing a million other things this morning in setting up the church before y'all got here. He was stacking chairs, piling stuff from the pods, setting up the parking team, getting everything ready. As an afterthought, I said, Mario, can you set up the whiteboard? And he had a million other things to do this morning. I mean, a million other things going on. So he went up and he hurriedly did it as a favor to me. Now, if I was a jerk and I, was, I wasn't looking at it in a Christian stance, then I would look at it as, Mario, did, Mario he didn't take it serious enough. And he, he, he set that up. So that leg would fall down there and make me look bad. Just because, Mario, you... Pfft, kind of a jerk, are you, Mario? But Mario didn't mean that because Mario was doing a million other things to serve this church and to serve me. It's very important to keep an open mind when you're, when you're in the body of Christ. Mario, hang around right there for just a minute because you know I'm going to need you in just a sec. All right. We're going to look at three passages of Scripture before we get into this illustration because I want to lay out the premise of what I'm trying to say. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. And it's got three points here, but it's all going to this illustration that I'm going to try to wrap up with. For we must all stand before Christ and be judged. Now, there's some scripture that is to certain people, like certain groups of people are like pastors or elders or deacons or whatever. Notice that this says, for we must all. That means you and you and you and you and me must all stand before Christ to be judged. God is going to judge you for how you are. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Next verse, guys. 1 Timothy, Michelle. Anytime now. <laughs> what? I know. I'm talking about Second Timothy. <laughs> Lord, there's a lot of differences this morning. <laughs> Again, that's a failure on my part to communicate to her what I was doing because I should have took the outline here. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Mm keeping it real Lord a servant of the Lord must not quarrel but must be kind to everyone be able to teach and be patient with difficult people whoa mm. yeah rut row because America ain't been doing so good on that this week has it America's been getting involved in some foolish quarrels and some petty arguments and the church has been doing it for a long time. I think the church was ahead of it before America was. As a sad note to think, but I think it was. And in John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35, this is Jesus talking before he's crucified. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other other your love for one another will prove to the world that you were my disciples it doesn't say love a group or love politics because the biggest device in this country today and the biggest thing that the devil is trying to do to separate us is to get us to not see people anymore but to see sides I'm on this side and you're on this side and I'm right and you're wrong and I'm always right, and you're always wrong, just because of the sides I'm on. I'm Democrat. You're Republican. You're not really. But you're, you're doing, I'm not affiliated with any political party. 
Because I refuse to take a side that tells me that just because I'm on this side that the other side's always wrong. Because the other side's standing there and doing the same thing. And there will never be any agreement in this country until we figure that out. God tells us to love people. And this is how he's going to judge us. Not on political parties and not on which side you're on, but he's going to judge you as people. As people. Different. Some tall, some skinny, some short. But that's how God's going to judge you. And what we do in this, uh, in this country, and what we do as a church, is that we take things like, like politics, and we'll... And then what we'll do is we'll take things and we'll, get, we'll make different groups in ourselves because people love to group themselves into different groups. Like, I think this way, so I'm in this group and you're in that group. And and then we choose sides and we draw our battle lines and we refuse to ever move from where we're at. Now, the problem with this is that God doesn't judge us in this way. The Republican Party isn't ever going to stand before God one day and be judged. Black Lives Matter isn't going to be stand before God together and be judged. The side you're on in any issue isn't going to stand before God one day and be judged. You are. Because God doesn't see sides when he looks at you. God sees you. He sees Dawn. He sees Kevin. He sees Corey. And he sees Candace, Michelle. These are people with names. Names. He sees John. He sees Doug. He sees Jan. He sees Mario. <laughs> Mario, come down here for a minute. We'll get her in the light. Now, this is church, and y'all all know Mario because he's Mario. Heck, he invited half of y'all here. <laughs> but the world, if we didn't know each other, would tell us that we could never love each other. Because you know what? Because if we were two guys walking down the street, one of us might be Democrat, one of us might be Republican. Mario's black. I'm white. We're different. Mario's a cop. I'm a pastor. There's been disagreements with that. And until I throw this away, as long as I'm looking at Mario through the eyes and through the lens of politics and what group he's in and what side he's on, I'm never going to see him for Mario. And the problem with that is that all that does is that throws out hate and that divides us. But when I look at Mario, as God tells me to look at Mario, he's a person and he's my brother. And I can do to Mario what God tells me to do to Mario. Which is love him. I love you, man. <laughs> as as uh, they come up here and close us out, um, I think we got a lot of figuring out to do as, as a country. And this is a church because... Um, 
it's not just a country issue, it's a church issue, which, which kind of tears me up even more because families have been ripped apart because of disagreements, because of which side they're on. We've got to start looking at each other as people and brothers and sisters in the family of God. As a matter of fact, when you get up there and you stand before God one day, He's not going to judge you by what group you're in. He's not going to judge you by former sinner. He's not going to judge you by drug addict. He's not going to judge you by a group of thieves. He's not going to judge you in any of that. He's going to see you and your name standing before Him. And he's going to know you by name. And he's going to know you as a son and a daughter. And he's going to love you. And I'm going to go down here and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for this church. I'm going to pray for this country. And if you're led, I encourage you to join me. That's all you want, buddy. Let's all stand one more time. Let's close out.
soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be always to love, not divide, and not condemn. I don't care where you've been from this morning, I've said it every service and I'm going to say it again. God brought you here for a reason. Because not because you're in a certain group that he likes, but because you're you and he loves you. He knows your name. He knows where you come from. And he knows where you're going. And he chooses to love you anyway. Not because of how good you are, but because of how good he is. I love you all. You're dismissed. See you again next Sunday.